Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I think we have a, a lot of people on board, so thank you for your patience there while we were waiting for people to get connected. So you're all very welcome to the UCD Institute of Food and Health public lecture. Um, my name is Dolores O'Reardon and I'm the director of the Institute of Food and Health. So this series is designed to give you the scientific evidence that underpins the relationship between diet and health issues. So this evening, our speaker is Amy Mullee. But before uh, Amy starts, we're first of all going to play you a short video from ARC. So I'll hand over to my colleague, Professor Lorraine Brennan, who was the instigator of the series that has proved very popular. So Lorraine will begin by commencing the video on the services of ARC. At ARC Cancer Support Centres, we know that when somebody is told that they have cancer, they worry about what will happen to them, to their lives and to their families. ARC supports anyone affected by cancer and their families, from diagnosis right through our treatment and beyond. We are a cancer support charity with locations right across Dublin that can offer you and your loved ones psychological, emotional and practical support free of charge to help manage the uncertainty that a cancer diagnosis can bring. All of our services, including our one-to-one -one therapies, counselling, acupuncture and reflexology, are provided by qualified, experienced therapists. Yoga and relaxation classes and stress management and survivorship courses offer techniques to support you and to help you to cope better. We also hold talks by specialists on cancer-related issues, such as speaking to children about cancer, nutrition, appearance, benefits and entitlements to help address your concerns and worries. We organise education programmes and we facilitate peer support groups to help you to live well. Our centres are conveniently located near the designated cancer centres in Dublin, so anyone affected by cancer living in Ireland is very welcome at ARC, where you can have a cuppa in one of our drop-in centres or you can find a peaceful space in our tranquil gardens. So why not call in to chat with one of our trained listening volunteers in a confidential and welcoming non-clinical setting. No need to make an appointment to drop by. And remember, all of our services are confidential and are free of charge. We're here for you. Okay, but that's wonderful. So now we're going to get the talk started uh, this evening. So the presentation is an important part of these public health lectures, but the other element of it is the opportunity for you, the public, to be able to pose your questions. So this evening, the moderator of the questions and answers is Professor Helen Roach. So I'll hand over to Ella, Helen, who will introduce you to the moderating panel, and then we'll get started with tonight's presentation. Over to you, Helen. Great, thanks very much Dolores. Um, you're all very welcome and thank you very much for joining us at this public lecture which is focused on nutrition and cancer, uh, specifically focusing really on prevention and survivorship. And it's great to be able to do this in collaboration with ARC. I was at an event, it was probably over a year ago, and ARC were outlining the type of work they were trying to achieve. And I thought it was a great opportunity wherein we could link our public lecture series with their clients in relation to the whole area of nutrition and cancer. And we're very lucky in UCD to have a number of researchers such as Amy Malee, who is an expert in this space, and she'll give you a lecture outlining key areas which we should look out for. In addition, on our panel, we're very lucky to have Patricia or Tricia Pugh, who's the Client Engagement Manager, and she's also a counsellor and psychotherapist with ARC. We have two colleagues from the Irish Nutrition and Dietetic Institute, both Fiona Ralston and also Ger Guiry. Both Fiona and Ger are registered dietitians, uh, registered with Coru, and both work in the nutrition and oncology area. Fiona, for example, she works in St. Luke's and would be a, an expert specifically in the whole area of radiation and uh, chemotherapy oncology. Jer Guiry, she's a senior dietitian at St. Vincent's University Hospital. And so both of those together with Trish and myself will compose the panel and we will be more than happy to address your questions as much as we can following Amy's presentation. 
So to introduce you to Amy, Amy is a nutrition um, lecturer. She initially trained with a BSc and a PhD in human nutrition in the University of Ulster. And then following this, she worked in the International Agency for Research in Cancer in Lyon and also based in Dublin. And so I'll hand over to you, Amy, and we'll listen to your lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. So thank you very much, Helen, for the introduction. Um, I hope you can all hear me. Um, as Helen said, my name is Amy, and uh, this lecture is about nutrition and cancer prevention and survivorship. So I guess um, every one of us has, has been affected by cancer in some way, um, either ourselves or a loved one. Um, and when this happens, we all want to do our best to help um, ourselves or that person. But unfortunately, there is a lot of misinformation out there. And when we go online, um, what be that on social media or bookshops or uh, Amazon or a bookshop or anything, there's lots of different headings and magazines and newspapers as well that are out there telling us different foods or different things that we can do with our diet um, to cure or to prevent cancer. And this can be quite confusing, um, but it can also be quite dangerous. So what I'm hoping to do today is to really outline for you the evidence that we do know about cancer prevention and survivorship and a little bit about how, how we as scientists evaluate that. So I'm sure um, for those of you who have previously attended um, these public health lectures, you will have seen this um, diagram before. So what we have here is a, a pyramid and this pyramid represents um, uh, the different types of studies that we use in research to um, make recommendations. So down here at the bottom of the pyramid, we have uh, the low quality evidence. And then as we move up the pyramid to the high quality evidence. So at the bottom is the anecdotal evidence. So anecdotal evidence is, for example, a video you might see in YouTube or maybe a personal story that you might read in a magazine of somebody who um, says that they've perhaps change something in their diet or start eating a particular food or supplement and they think that that has worked for them. But that's just their own um, singular experience and we don't really um, use that to give any recommendations. So as we move up then we have observational studies and so observational studies um, come in a variety of different ways um, but one of the main ways we use that in cancer research is that we, um, especially for prevention, is that we will um, gather a large group of people from the population, usually representative, and we'll ask them lots of questions about their lifestyle and their diet, and then we'll follow them for long periods of time. Um, however, um, association does not mean causation. So just because something appears to be related, it doesn't necessarily mean that it is. And we often use experimental studies then to support this. Um, and so in the hierarchy of evidence, then um, at the top, we have randomized control trials being the best type of evidence. Um, however, it's really hard to do these type of studies uh, for cancer prevention because it's, it's um, uh, a disease that takes a long time to develop. However, we do use these types of studies for cancer survivorship. So where do we get evidence from? So if we think just about, for example, uh, an article that you might read in the paper saying that a certain food um, or nutrient is going to help prevent cancer. And then if we think about recommendations, so whole dietary recommendations that might be made by the Department of Health, um, where do they come from and what is the difference between that? So Really, um, this article over here, it, it might only be based on one single study. And that single study um, can't really give us the same kind of confidence and power in, in our recommendations as what we used to give the public health recommendations or the recommendations that your dietitian or your doctor would give you. So this evidence is based on hundreds of different studies that have been carried out. And so that we're able to have um, confidence in that. And so 
It might be that this single study is only carried out in a small group. It could even be a group as small as four or five or 10. Um, so it's not really based on a lot of variation. It's not taking into account different populations from different countries or men or women or different sized people or people with different diseases. Um, whereas when we have hundreds of studies or many studies that we use to inform our recommendations, we tend to get that from larger groups of, of people carried out in different clinical settings, different populations, countries, and different types of people, different ages. And that allows us to have greater confidence in the evidence that we have. So what is the evidence that we know around diet and cancer? So there's an organization that's primarily based in the UK called the World Cancer Research Fund International. And they also have a number of sister charities ar around the world in Hong Kong, the Netherlands and, and the UK. And they have a scientific team that works continually on a continuous update project that reviews all of the evidence that there is around um, diet, cancer, in particular around nutrition, weight, and physical activity. So every year they're reviewing this evidence and every they're constantly updating their cancer prevention recommendations. And what we've seen um, consistently for the last few years is that the evidence is all pointing in the same direction. So there's a number of different recommendations and I'm going to go through them individually. So the first one that they have is to be a healthy weight. So for cancer prevention, um, it's important to keep your weight within the healthy range and avoid um, weight gain in adult life. So there's a number of things that we can do to support this. And that is one, thinking about what's on your plate, thinking about how you can reduce um, the higher calorie foods on your plate and include more fruits and vegetables. Also keeping an eye on the portion size. So thinking, um, about how much of food we eat. So it can be some, something as simple as switching to a smaller plate or a smaller bowl um, and just taking a little bit less food each time we eat. Also um, reading food labels um, as well can give us better insight into how much fat a food has or how many calories it has so we can keep an eye on how much we're eating. And then also being more active will also help us to keep a healthy weight. Then the second thing we can do to protect ourselves from developing cancer is to eat a diet rich in whole grains, vegetables, fruits and beans. And um, so things such as pulses, lentils um, are really important. So some of the ways we can do that is by eating a really good variety of plant based foods. Um, as I said, whole grains, vegetables, fruits uh, and beans and then aiming to get at least five of these a day. Um, another thing you can do is also the same as for the weight gain is to reshape your plate. So to think about increasing, say now if you have about a quarter of your plate, fruit and veg, to increase that to a third, um, just to help in, in, increase the amount that we're eating. Then another one is to limit the consumption of, of fast foods, so of highly processed foods and um, that are high in fat or starches or sugar. And doing this helps us to maintain our weight um, and to reduce our calorie intake. So what do we think of as high calorie foods or a really energy dense foods? So foods that have a lot of calories in a small amount and um, things like chocolate, sweets, um, biscuits, cake, ice cream, and other fast foods such as burgers, chips, or, or fried foods, and also pastries. So just to be conscious of limiting the amount of foods that we eat to just a few times or less a week, also keeping conscious of the food labels and trimming off fat from high fat products. Um, and another way we can protect ourselves is by limiting the consumption of red and processed meat. Um, so while meat um, is a really important source of nutrients and it's a really important source of protein, we, we should not aim to, to eliminate it from our diet, but it's more about moderating the, fat, the amount that we eat. So in terms of beef, pork and lamb, eating three um, portions a week should be sufficient to provide us with um, those nutrients. And then we should really be aiming to eat little, if none at all, of processed meat. But we can still continue um, 
to eat other sources of protein, turkey, poultry, but also beans, lentils, pulses, eggs. Um, so really it's just about reducing the amount of meat if we're eating over that amount. And, but also thinking about easy swaps. So thinking about swapping um, maybe one portion of red meat for something like turkey or an egg, um, or also thinking about maybe introducing uh, a meat-free day. So even traditionally in Ireland, for example, we wouldn't have eaten meat on Fridays. So, so maybe thinking about doing something like that. So then another way um, that we can do is to limit our consumption of sugar, sweetened drinks. So this is mainly um, because we don't generally think about the calories that we that we drink. We think about the calories that we eat, and this can be an important contributor to weight gain. So really what the advice is to do is to choose alternatives to sugar sweetened drinks, and these mainly should be in the form of increasing our water, which is also important um, for our health as well in many other ways, um, having unsweetened tea or coffee, um, and then having some juices, but, but limiting that amount as well. Um, in terms of uh, artificially sweetened drinks, there isn't really clear evidence out there in relation to cancer, um, but there is some suggestive evidence um, that is saying that we should be careful of the amount of um, artificially sweetened drinks that we drink. So really choosing, choosing water is the ideal choice here. So then in terms of alcohol consumption, really um, for, for cancer prevention, it's really best not to drink any cancer at all. And um, particularly if you're a smoker, drinking alcohol uh, really increases your risk of cancer even further. So there's a number of things that we can do um, to reduce that. Um, even if we can reduce our alcohol a little bit, every, every bit helps. So one of the things we can do is to opt for the smallest serving size um, or to alternate our alcoholic drinks. Every second drink, have a glass of water. Another thing we could do is to dilute our drinks. So to add um, some low sugar lemonade or some soda water. Um, also avoiding salty snacks can be beneficial as well as they really increase our thirst so that we drink more. Nowadays also there's a lot of low alcohol or alcohol free alternatives which um, can help us to reduce our alcohol intake. And then another thing is as well not to stock up on alcohol at all. Having alcohol in our home will, will only tempt us. And we can also think about changing um, our alcohol habits as well. Then there's another a number of other things that they recommend um, as well. So one of them is not to use supplements. So not to take vitamin, mineral or, or other food supplements. So in the form of tablets or pills. And really what we should be aiming um, for is to meet our nutritional needs through diet alone. And this is because um, there's lots of other components in food that are also beneficial that we would be missing out on if we're only eating them in their purified form. It's also important to be physically active and to get as much physically active activity as we can during the day and, and also to sit less. So I think with all of us um, being at home or working at home now, this is especially important. And this is really important for um, preventing weight gain as well. Also, if you are a mother, um, breastfeeding your baby if you can has been shown to reduce um, risk of cancer. Um, obviously, this is a personal choice, but if you can, it is beneficial. And then in terms of um, cancer survivorship, really, if you have had a cancer um, diagnosis and you've finished treatment, the advice is to follow the recommendations if you can. However, if you have been advised differently or if you feel that you have any specific um, nutritional needs, really it's advised that you speak um, with your doctor or a dietitian. However, if you are currently um, receiving treatment for cancer, you're likely to have special um, nutritional requirements. And there are a number of different resources that are available to support you with that. And I'll mention a few of them at the end. But really, if you have any special needs that you are concerned about, the advice really is to speak to your um, doctor and ask to be referred to a dietitian. 
So I just wanted to speak as well a little bit about controversies or myths that are quite common um, in relation to cancer. So we all have read the headlines, as, as I discussed earlier in the paper, paper example. So there was one, you know, chips cause cancer or dairy products. So there's a number of those that are quite common and we hear about them a lot in research and, and also um, the dietitians hear about them a lot. So um, I'm just going to go through a few of them. So one of them is superfoods. So I'm sure you've all heard of superfoods and superfoods are particular foods um, that have been attributed um, to have um, characteristics that can be really beneficial. So people you might have heard a bit about blueberries or broccoli or different foods that are supposed to have uh, benefits in relation to cancer over and above what normal foods would have. So this really, there's, there's no such thing as a superfood. Um, and generally this comes from research that's shown about the beneficial uh, effects of consuming fruit and vegetables. Um, and they are a really important part of our diet. And as I said earlier, a really important part uh, of um, what we should con be consuming. Um, then in terms of pesticides and organic foods, um, again, there's no clear evidence to show um, that pesticides, um, as we consume them in Europe and that has occur in our diet, are increasing our risk of cancer. In Europe, the European Food Safety Authority is constantly monitoring our risks and there is no evidence at all to show that the trace elements that we might be consuming on our food has any um, detrimental effect. So there is some evidence to show that some particular pesticides have been dangerous and that's generally been in people who work with them on a daily basis and exposed to them in extremely high amounts um, and really even then um, it's very hard to get a clear picture from the research. In terms of organic foods, again, there is no evidence to show that consuming organic foods um, is of particular benefit in relation to cancer. Um, both um, unorganic and non-organic foods are extremely important. And again, eating plenty of fruit and vegetables is very um, important for reducing our risk and for general health. Organic food does um, have benefits to the environment and there is no, that's a personal choice um, if you would like to consume them or not. Then in terms of milk and dairy products, um, again, there is no evidence to show that consuming milk and dairy products is um, going to increase your risk of cancer. If anything, it's a good source of calcium, protein, and other nutrients that are really important for health. The evidence that came out, I think, uh, a while ago that was suggestive to people was around growth hormones in, in dairy herds, but um, that is no longer used in Europe and therefore there is there's no known risk. In terms of green tea as well, that's another common one that consuming green tea can reduce your risk of cancer. However, that's been really thoroughly researched and um, originally came from a compound in green tea known as catechins that doesn't occur in black tea. Um, however, again, once that was thoroughly researched, um, we could see that there was no real evidence to show any benefit, in particular for green tea. So then for tomatoes, so tomatoes um, are really commonly consumed and there's a nutrient that occurs in tomatoes and tinned tomatoes, fresh tomatoes, tomato sauces, and it's called lycopene. And there has been some evidence to suggest that high consumption of tomatoes may be beneficial um, in aggressive prostate cancer. But again, once that was more thoroughly researched, really it wasn't um, very clear. And we don't have the evidence at this time to, to say that that has a particular benefit. And then finally for sugar, so sugar is a common one that we hear about that people are eliminating sugar for cancer. But again, sugar um, in its basic form, we know it as glucose and glucose is the primary food of, of all the cells in the body and important for us to be able to live and to generate energy. Um, and there is, while cancer cells do use glucose, so, so do all the other um, cells in our body. And there's no evidence to show um, that eating sugar increases your risk 
of developing cancer. However, as I said about the uh, the, the sweetened drinks and, and the high calories, I think consuming sugar in moderation is, is recommended in line with a healthy diet, but nothing above or beyond that in relation to cancer. So as I mentioned, there's a number of resources that are available to support you um, in, in eating a healthy diet in relation to cancer prevention, but also in terms of during your treatment and, and once you've finished your treatment. So the first link there is for the Irish Nutrition and Diet, Dietetic Institute, um, which is the registered body for dietitians in Ireland. And there you can source useful fact sheets and also get contact details for private dietitians if you'd like to see one outside of your healthcare team. Also, there is the Cancer Research UK um, with the food controversies. If you'd like to read up more about some of those foods and, and other foods um, that have been linked to cancer in the media, but for which there is not clear evidence for. Um, as I mentioned, the World Cancer Research Fund, they conduct a, a lot of research synthesis on cancer and diet. And they have um, excellent resources um, in terms of recipes, um, what you can do for cancer prevention, but also eating well during cancer and dealing with common cancer side effects in relation to diet. And then there at the bottom is the link to Breakthrough Cancer Research. So they have a number of really excellent um, cookbooks with also information contained in them. And they've been developed by Dr. Aoife Ryan from University College Cork. Um, who's a dietitian along with her team of dietitians to support you um, through your cancer journey and also in eating once you've finished your treatment. So I'd just like again to draw attention to the fact that ARC Cancer Support Centres offer a support line um, and they're there to help you and now during COVID they also have online services as well. Um, that can be offered to you from your home. So you can contact them there on, on their number um, or through their email. And I'm sure if you just Google our cancer support, you'll be able to um, find their contact details easily. So finally, I'd just like to say thank you very much for joining. Um, I hope you found that useful and I'll hand back now to Helen for the questions.